Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so glad you can make it uh, to this lecture. Uh, the chair, uh, Anita Beresvetia, is uh, involved uh, this evening with the uh, GSE Visiting Committee. So she's asked me to uh, introduce our speaker this evening, Michael um, Jacob, and I do so with great uh, pleasure and honor. So just a very quick um, introduction. In conformity with the conventions of the genre, which typically allows for a, a humility inspiring and, and or numbing enumeration of publications, projects, laurels, and institutional affiliations, sometimes oddly constellated, and at other times forming novel intellectual geographies, including in this case the possibility of faux mountains. First, a few words about our distinguished guest, Vita. A documentary filmmaker and radio journalist, philosopher and scholar, exhibition curator and editor of a prominent journal, Comparaison, Jacob teaches comparative literature at Grenoble University and history and theory of landscape at Apia. The latter, Apia, because of, or rather in spite of my pronunciation, and I should never attempt French when I'm nervous or rushed, and at the moment I'm both, uh, <laughs> Might at, first sound, uh, might at first hearing sound like Estia, the god of the hearth of the uh, oikos, or the ordering principles of architecture as such, who is venerated on the Acropolis. Rather, Apia is an acronym, as naturally rendered in a Helvetic family of type, universalizing and unmistakable, it stands for the haute école du paysage d'ingénierie et d'architecture. The highest ambitions and underlying challenges internal to these mutually supporting fields were examined in the touring exhibition, The Swiss Touch and Landscape, in which Jacob sought to establish, uh, uh, not to establish or validate a school of Swiss landscape architecture, but rather to identify a certain general idea. Lately, we speak and think much of natural cultures, specifically and perhaps troublingly what they once were or had been, a tense discussion at that, but one made still more compelling in Switzerland, a republic of four national languages, three of them officially recognized by the Federation, Federal Confederation, a place Max Frisch once called a country without utopia, a complication of geographies that unite in a collective will to work with necessity, a phrase Jacob derives from the Enlightenment era polymath Albrecht von Haller. A more recent literary scholar to these remote places, Lytle Shaw, saw in the bridges of Robert Maillard and in the photography of the brothers Harry and Bruno Werley a struggle against gravity. In Shaw's genre-bending account, the struggle is tragicomic. As for gravitation, we are meant to understand from other more reliable sources that it is a universal law. I think I've already provided enough hints while presenting Jacob's very considerable accomplishments that some thought needs to be given to the question of the generic and the specific. We are, after all, called tonight to hear about the new generic. As you will note in the lecture program, the words in question, like a picturesque eye catcher, appear entre guillemets, a sign, if any, that there's perhaps more to it than first appears, or perhaps less. Literary theory, a, uh, a field in which um, Michael is just <laughs> phantasmagorically you know, well prepared and trained, provides the most relevant, though arguably not the most comprehensive discourse in the general in particular, that distinction belonging to botanical and zoological systematics in the service of which nomenclatural conventions make universal sense of the Latin binomial system composed of the generic name and the specific epithet. One of its fondest literary proponents was the Genevan exile, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, an inveterate herborizer. But certainly, the best known of the literary critical flowers is Imlac's discourse and poetry in Samuel Johnson's Rasselas, an apologue about happiness, to cite the name of a relatively unfamiliar genre. The business of the poet, Johnson writes, is to examine not the individual, but the species, to remark general properties and large appearances. The poet does not number the streaks of the tulip or describe the different shades in the verdure of the forest. Needless to say, there were dissenters from Johnson's prescription of these features, which one poet may vigilantly remark upon and another carelessly neglect. William Blake most notably disdained this lesser platonic theory of perception. To generalize is to be an idiot, he exclaimed. Particularize is alone distinction of merit. And this, all sublimity is found on the minute discrimination. <laughs> 
George Sainsbury, the literary historian and wine connoisseur, and I think that latter attribution somehow matters in this context, was more measured in his response, but despaired of the potentially leveling effects. We are off the sacred heights now. If the poet must, in his words, consult the laziness and dullness of his readers by merely portraying prominent and striking features. Such an accommodation would rule out poetic strangeness. It would rather make convention and familiarity the keys to the poetic kingdom of heaven. Who am I to say, but entering heaven, which is said to be above, should not be that easy. What I can say most assuredly is that Michael Jacob was not Samuel Johnson's man. He is vigilant, careful, but also more importantly, a creative and playful observer, a remarker, to use Johnson's phrase, of phenomena, capturing not only that which is apt to be overlooked, but also finding what no one else thought to look for, and making his report of the discovery as fresh as the newfound thing in the world. To read his most recent book, The Bench in the Garden of 2017, is to recognize instantly and by turns what a gifted storyteller he is, which is what a any engaging interpreter hopes to be. What is the new generic? Is it merely the newness of it that makes it particular? Can the generic in itself be specific? I can't wait to hear. So. <laughs> Uh, I will take my very unbench-like seat in the audience and invite Michael uh, Jacob to the podium. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. The, um, the general idea of this presentation is a rather simple one, and it's a straightforward, straightforward one. Uh, can we speak today? Um, of the rise of a new generic in landscape architecture and more generally in the planning disciplines? Are we faced to an ongoing standardization with the result of a more uniform landscape? Does um, contemporary design produce a banal reality? Um, and if so, and I really believe uh, that at least uh, partly it's a case, for what reasons? And should designers react to it? And should we educators react to it that uh, the world around us becomes more uniform? My idea is to put it differently and to say it uh, right out that we are indeed confronted with a strong and negative impact of a new generic that fabricates an increasing number of extremely similarly designed landscapes everywhere around the world. The terms we use in order to describe the world are, however, never neutral, and they need some form of initial explanation. Banal, ordinary, uniform, uniformity, standardized, gener generic, the same, sameness, homogeneous. There is a lot, there exists a lot of different categories which we can use to describe the phenomenon I'm interested in. Banal, for instance, orig originally from French banal, common to all, means so lacking in originality as to be obvious and boring. Generic is that which is not specific, lacking, lacking imagination or individuality, the unoriginal, if you want. Ordinary, ordinary is something with no special or distinctive features, the normal. The ordinary is not interesting or exceptional. It is commonplace. Standardized is something that conforms to a standard. Sameness means lack of variety, uniformity, or monotony. This extremely rapid survey shows us that there is a system which implies both value judgments and formal criteria when we deal with the phenomenon I have in mind. We could organize it by a strictly dualistic system of oppositions, original versus unoriginal, variety versus monotony, interesting versus boring, specific versus common, individuality versus standard, special versus commonplace, distinct versus uniformity, exceptional versus ordinary, and so on. The term I find most interesting, at least in order to begin with, is standard, because it relates not only to a noun, but to a verb, to standardize. I don't want to start with moral or aesthetic or formal criteria, uh, but with standardization, given that it suggests at the same time a process, a general framework, and a historical background. 
Let's initiate, therefore, with the last element, a brief survey concerning the history of standards and standardization. Standardization begins, as we know, in Great Britain with a small object, the screw. The first national standard worldwide was the one regarding the screw shred in 1841, stating a um, shred angle of 55 degrees. Joseph Whitworth, the promoter of the British Standard Whitworth, or BSW, was so successful that the British Railway adapted his system. Standards go from the tiny screw to railway systems and then to the English Standard Committee founded in 1901, that is to the first industry standards. From the beginning, standardization is however not limited to the production of industrial objects. It is rather a process of articulating and influencing te technical knowledge. Multidisciplinary by essence, standardization touches several aspects at the same time. Economics, politics, science, technology, labor, business, and even culture. If we consider units of measurement as another essential element of standardization, we get aware that it touches even our Weltanschauung, the way we actually look at the world. As for measurements, we should not forget that Condorcet, the French ideologist of the meter and of other standardized units, links standardization with the French Revolution and the idea of rationality shared by everyone. This is the original meter in Rue Vaugirard in Paris. Another aspect we have to take into consideration, and I'll come back to it later on, is the almost immediate application of standardization to the most advanced technologies of communication. We can easily trace a line from the development of the global telegraph uh, standard, a very important instrument of British imperialism, to the railroad system and to electricity and to the, and to the contemporary internet standards. Standardization is, however, never neutral. On the contrary, uh, think of standardization of, for example, uh, industrial. So here you have some examples of the railway system and standardization becoming more and more important with the railway system and uh, what happens when things are not so much standardized. And uh, standardization is never neutral. So it thinks of the standardization of industrial parts in American armories for the production of muskets, for example. And once uh, standardization became a major trend in the 20th century, the danger of the application of mass production to biology, for example, very well suggested in Huxley's Brave New World, where I quote, he speaks about standard men and women. Or we could think here again, uh, standardization of mankind, or think about Westworld and the perfect cyborgs, and so on. A relatively recent example of a successful standardization is a container. <clears throat> Containers existed already in the 19th century, but standardization uh, really became important in the 20th century. While the first international standard was adopted in 1933, the new ISO standard with a now usually 40 foot or 12.2 meter containers was imposed only after 1960. This kind of standardization raises, of course, no real questions. The disappearance of differences and of variety in containers is no problem, but it's rather the solution of a problem. If it comes to objects where aesthetics matter, things are, however, more complicated. In uh, an important book few people read today, The Shape of Time, by George Kubler, it was, I think, Robert Smithson's favorite book, uh, Kubler puts up a very interesting theory of things. His main idea is that objects exist always in series. The series begins with prototypes, which permit the development of different models, and then the series lives on until at a certain moment the series comes to an end. The series of containers, for example, started in the 19th century, and once the international standard was adopted, every possible development inside the series comes to an end. Let's come now to a second way to try to enter the problem of standardization. <clears throat> so the relation between identity and difference in three fields relevant for landscape architecture. What about difference, variety, and individuality, first of all, in architecture, then in the history of the city, in urbanism, and thirdly, in the built environment in general? Dealing with architecture at a very general scale, we could speak of standardization or uniformity by highlighting several aspects. 
Take the formal uniformity of buildings, the reproduction of almost the same form in time and space. Examples could go from the classical and the neoclassical architecture to the international time, style. It is typical, for instance, not to recognize immediately the age of neoclassical architecture. Normally, when we see these examples, we always we say they all look the same. Another example of uniformization is the use of the same material. Still another one is stylistic uniformity. Here, the results are so standardized that the general pattern works rather as a model than a real type. Still another aspect concerns production. Constructions built by applying the same standard procedures. Quite often, all these aspects exist parallelly and overlap. Think, for instance, of the infamous Plattenbauten, or large panel system buildings of the former East Germany. Plattenbauten, a type of building consisting of large prefabricated concrete slabs, became, after a first avant-gardistic project in Berlin in the 1930s, the standard method to build the Neubaugebiete, the new development areas of the country. The architects of this kind of social housing, we, we could make rather say anti-social housing, developed subtypes with poetic names like P2, VBS70, or VHH GT18, models that marked for several decades a general impression of GDR's urban landscapes. Here you see the material. And here you see the result. Or here again, you know, these extremely standardized places in the former German Democratic Re Republic. Here again. But uh, I asked myself if the destruction of Pruitt Igo, the famous urban housing project in St. Louis, Missouri, in the mid 70s, you remember that Charles Jenks always says postmodernism begins with the destruction of these. Uh, of uh, Proitaigo cannot be re read as a reaction against uniformity as well, besides the well-known problems there of poverty, crime, and radioactivity, and so on. Here you have the, the famous image. Uh, after the, um, this first negative example, we can, of course, think of uh, some positive examples. At least uh, take, for example, the British city of Bass. Bath celebrated as a particularly beautiful and picturesque city, and the only British city uh, recognized as a World Heritage Site, owes its celebrity partly to the uniformity of its material, golden-colored local sandstone, and to the form of its identical facades. The effect of repetition, intended by architect John Wood, was understood as a particularly fitting for a disposition responding to the rules of classical decorum. One could, of course, immediately add to these examples those of innumerable, of many gated communities or anonymous urbanizations, of sprawlscapes, and of many other sites marked by an extreme sense of repetition and uniformity. Here again, examples of. What about the quality of contemporary sprawlscapes, the one which we saw before, compared, for example, to Olmsted's Riverside? What happened between Riverside and uh, our contemporary urban landscapes and uh, sprawlscapes? Let's remark before continuing with architecture that the existence of these patterns raises almost immediately some fundamental problems of aesthetics, of psychology, and even of ontology. Does a work of art has necessarily to be unique in order to please? For Walter Benjamin, for, in for instance, the historical situation changed once with the Industrial Revolution and the possibility to reproduce the same object infinitely once the work of art lost its aura. Erotic objects have a strong identity and indiv individuality, while post-erotic objects lack such a quality. Or uh, is Kant right when he affirms that works of art touch us by their form, rather by content or idea, that the form of this building, that uh, it's always the form of this building which touches us independently of uh, um, the other factors? Naturally, I will come back to the, uh, some of uh, 
the idea of uh, standardization in, and the political impact of standardization raised already by Benjamin. But uh, there are other examples which we can cite when we look for uh, a definition of order. Uh, think of, for example, of Ernst Gombrich's The Sense of Order. Gombrich speaks about an almost anthropological or universal need for regularity. And he thinks that at the level of our most fundamental perceptions, we are always order-oriented. But is the role of patterning, our responsiveness to pattern, really universal, or rather the result of an order-oriented ideology? We know that Gombrich uh, borrows his uh, sense of order from Karl Popper, and Karl Popper insists himself on the role of schemata. So uh, does this mean that order is simply something inborn is something natural for mankind? Or is it, on the contrary, um, an idea of the 18th and 19th century which becomes fundamental only with, in the theories of these people? Uh, Jay Appleton, for example, adapted this idea in landscape studies, where he thinks that uh, when we recognize a certain pattern of uh, landscape, we, um, it's always a recognizability of this landscape which makes that, uh, which raises in us a positive, uh, positive feeling. Is an urban landscape enhanced by uniformity, or uh, is uh, uniformity the best example of urban beauty? There is, of course, another aspect which is fundamental in Kantian aesthetics is the, the sense of autonomy, the autonomy or individuality of the work of art. From the 18th century on, individuality, originality, uniqueness becomes a central value. And normally we expect now from things that please us a high degree of uniqueness. And the same objects we loved a moment ago uh, become, please, don't please us anymore if they lack originality or individuality. Let's add to this first reflection a second layer, introducing two new categories, the banal and the ordinary. Ordinary is something that lacks originality versus the extraordinary, where originality immediately calls for our attention. Things that are banal should not be confused with ordinary things. Banal is that which disappears in its context without necessarily being ordinary. Something ordinary doesn't call for our attention as something ordinary does not call for our attention as well, but once we observe it, we remark that it is isolated in its context. The opposite of something banal is, for example, a monument, a construction that requires, as in the case of the extraordinary, our attention. The French architect Auguste Perret one of the, was one of the foremost advocates of a banal architecture. For him, the banal was not the ordinary, but ce qui semblerait avoir toujours existé, qui en un mot serait banal, that which seems always having already existed. A banal architecture is one that one doesn't remark, an architecture that, at least at the first time, disappears. Perret would claim that his Le Havre buildings with their 6 and 24 meter scheme are banal, but never ordinary. Another aspect of positive banality in architecture is the use of new building methods. Le Corbusier, for instance, was proud of using a general constructor for his La Tourette Monastery, who just did the job. It was a constructor who normally built dams in the Alps. So the making of the construction was banal, but the result was extraordinary. And Le Corbusier, as we know, he really very often liked to affirm that God likes symmetry. And we see the trace of this in his uh, urban visions like the Ville Radieuse, huh? where in extremely standardized, with its extremely standardized building times. There are still other factors we have to think about when trying to define the horizon of our inquiry, standardization or homogeneity. One essential ele element is the introduction of samples or catalogs for more or less standardized architecture. The history uh, of this genre, from the pattern books of the 18th century to the manuals and programs of the Beaux-Arts style, to contemporary catalogs where you can choose the style of your building, is still to be written. There are few studies about the influence of this standardization, and uh, 
I think this would be, it would be very important to, to see how standardization, both in architecture and in urbanism and in other disciplines, uh, has really a starting point in many of these publications. Uh, even in this famous photograph of the Beaux-Arts Society in New York, we see that uh, the top of the buildings is, uh, well, naturally individual, and it's a size skyscraper, as we know, but the basis is still a very common language. We could cite, at the same time, architects who powerfully try to work against standardization, like Adolf Loos and uh, his famous Villa Müller, uh, for instance, uh, where we see uh, that uh, Loos was always uh, extremely critical of standardization, of homogeneity, both in the eclectic style and in what he called the modernists. And sometimes he went so far that he even complicated infinitely the function inside his uh, constructions in order to build something extremely individual and completely against any possible standard, even if uh, some of these solutions seem to not to be logic. Given that architecture always exists in a context and that the main context is that of the city, the problem of standardization and uniformity can only be treated in the vaster framework of the urban fabric. Even a very brief analysis of the dialectics of uniformity versus variety in the urban context confronts us immediately with a very complex phenomenon. Let's not forget, first of all, that for Vitruvius, uniformity was an essential value next to firmitas and all the other values, even if his sense of uniformity has more to do with symmetry than with architectural sameness. The Vitruvian sense of uniformity reminds us, however, of the quintessential category of order. The importance of order comes from the Greek idea of cosmos, that is the well-ordered universe. For the ancient Greek, we live in a perfectly ordered, finite totality, built by the first mover, or first architect, the supreme god, if you, go, if you want. The seven planets, the seven winds, and many other sacred entities, marked always by the number four, seven, or ten, express a harmony of the universe. The utopic projects of the perfect cities of Renaissance, for example, Philaretes, here you see the four elements. Uh, we saw the four elements as a general structure or order of the universe. These ideas will influence, uh, for example, Philaretes, ideal city, and many, many other projects of ideal, city, ideal cities uh, throughout the Renaissance. It is, however, only in the 19th century that order, the term, the term order is, of course, polysemic, becomes the key concept of city planning. Préfet Haussmann Osman's Paris is probably the starting point of an operation that still influences the design of many cities around the world. Here you see the city of Paris, the allegory of city of Paris, the body of city of Paris being transformed, being destroyed by Baron Osman, his architects and landscape architects, and who destroy the old organic Paris in order to transform it into something new. Charles Baudelaire, for instance, he understood immediately, he will, maybe he was the most lucid observer of this transformation, and he saw how the old organic Paris, Le Vieux Paris n'existe plus, was transformed into something mechanical and marked by order. And Baron Osman's project, at the same time militaristic, uh, with the boulevards, hygienistic and economical, created a cityscape marked by highly uniform facades, standardized boulevards, squares, and so on. From the second half of the 19th century on, stressing the importance of the visual uniformity of the city became a fundamental goal. The new cityscapes had to be legible, and this was not only the case in the center, but in the margins as well, as well as in the new standardized suburban districts. Order and uniformity became at the same time the condition, or if you want the synonym, if you want, of mod modern beauty. The French even invented the professional figure of the architect voyer, voyer from Latin viarius, the controller of the roads. In 19th century Paris, especially in Osman's Paris, there was this figure, the architect voyer, who had to control, a sort of inspector, he had to control that roads and buildings, squares and facades, they corresponded to a general standard. 
The uniform cityscape, which survives in our contemporary urban realities, marked, for instance, by condominization, becomes visible in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Lang is, by the way, very much away very much aware of the political implications of an urban pattern characterized by almost total uniformity. His deconstruction of a dangerous urban utopia highlights the contradictions of two concurrent systems with a strong tendency for uniformity. There is, on the one hand, communism and its desire to create unique and highly standardized urban patterns. We saw the Plattenbauten before. You have architecture and people standardized. And on the other hand, the capitalist system with the powerful technologies is equally interested in standardization, primarily not for political, but for economic reasons. This is a general background we have to keep in mind if we want to remind those voices throughout the 20th century that called for a critical approach of uniformity, order, and homogeneity. Bruno Zevi's Architettura Organica Organic architecture, published in 1945, can serve as a first example. Zevi, who founded the APAO, Association for Organic Architecture, criticized frequently the excess of tautology in contemporary architecture. The principal aim of his criticism was what he termed fascist architecture. Fascist architecture is indifferent to the social needs and forgets quite often the most elementary functions of the building. It is characterized by symmetry, or an excess in symmetry, symmetry for the symmetry's sake, and proportion. Most of the buildings Zevi had in mind look like boxes, scatole, statical autistic entities with no relation whatever to other buildings and the immediate surroundings. 20 years later, Aldo Rossi published L'Architettura della Città, The Architecture of the City. Rossi interprets the city as an architectural totality and as a main scene of all human activities. He further underlined that cities realize themselves thanks to the idea they have of their own development. It's a very idealistic idea, a neo-Hegelian idea of the city building itself. Dealing with individuality in the urban context, Rossi stresses the essential role of monuments versus all other mainly functional constructions. A monument stands at the center, I quote, it is usually surrounded by buildings and becomes a place of attraction. Uh, monuments are always individual, highly individual, while all the other constructions are not. Let's take a third famous source for an advocacy for the individual or non-generic in the urban context, Kenneth Frampton's highly influential paper, Towards a Critical Reg Reg Regionalism. Frampton starts with a citation by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, worried about the effects of universalization giving rise to a mediocre civilization. Ricoeur regrets that we, I, I quote, we find everywhere throughout the world the same bad movie, the same slot machines, the same plastic and aluminum atrocities. And I would add today myself the same urban landscape, the same plazas, the same squares, the same streetscapes, streetscapes and so on. The contemporary lack of quality in urban form is, according to Frampton, in part predetermined by the imperatives of production. Confronted to the victory of universal civilization, or what he calls a bureau landschaft cityscape, we should carefully opt for a variant of regionalism being capable to combine the local and the universal, the individual and the abstract. Critical regionalism as a lucid form of resistance and cultural strategy could be the solution in order to mediate between universal civilization and specific local elements providing a synthesis between world culture, diversity, and universal civilization, identity, imposed by the system. Frampton calls on the one hand for the deconstruction of world culture, intended as a catalog of forms we have learned to mix, sort of mixed salad architecture, or mixed salad or urbanism, or very eclectic. And he invites us at the same time to face critically universal civilization, especially where we rely too heavily, too heavily on technology. Before I come to landscape and landscape architecture, let me mention still another relatively recent theory. The French philosopher and anthropologist Marc Auger has highlighted during the last two decades a phenomenon he identified by him as non-lieu, non-places. In opposition to places, that is spatial entities that oriented mankind until very recently on a worldwide basis, well-identified places bounded and with a strong identity, hypermodernity, he speaks about surmodernité, develops more and more highly standardized realities. If Auger starts like Frampton with a positive model of bounded places, 
He nevertheless stresses that even these places are in reality, are in reality social and mental constructions. Places, lieu, have three main qualities. They provide a sense of identity, <clears throat> they are relational, that is actively related to other places, part of a system, and they are historical. They have a minimum history, which confers to them a sense of stability. Non-places, on the other hand, have no identity. They are non-relational, and they exist in a sort of timeless body, bubble. According to Auger, our contemporary civilization produces an increasing number of non-places. With non-places, he intends two related phenomena. One is a certain type of such places, places linked to the transport system, for example, airports, train stations, gas stations, uh, or to commerce, shopping malls, or to the tourism industry, hotels and restaurants. The other thing which is interesting is our attitudes toward these places. When we actually find ourselves in these non-places, we never really experience them. We're never interested in their identity or history. They have no history or form. We just use them. We're simply there, but we could be anywhere else. It doesn't matter. Contemporary tourism, arguably the first industry worldwide, contributes to the dissemination of even more non-places, ex-territorial spots where we don't really have any experiences. The anti-utopic quality of these insular places becomes even problematic if we consider the fact that most of them are linked to privatization and to security. These uh, apparently happy islands of atmospheric capitalism are in reality spaces of total control. And the culture of control has, as we can add, in its turn a clear influence on how these places are planned, built, or landscaped. With the final result that L'espace du non-lieu ne crée ni identité singulière, ni relation, mais solitude et similitude. So the non-places create a sense, uh, they never create a sense of individual identity or relation, but solitude and sameness. Uh, Counter-example for, for, for the non-places uh, um, cited by Marc Auger would be a gas station like our friend Nader Tehrani's gas station in uh, Los Angeles, or a uh, uh, shopping mall, uh, or a commercial center like uh, James Wine's uh, best. Uh, uh, so we can imagine other ways to define it. Let me now go a step further and I'll look for a moment to similar phenomena in the field of landscape. At first hand, landscape seems the opposite of all these realities characterized by standardization, uniformization, sameness. Landscape, perceived landscape, is by definition a, place of la a piece of land or nature seen by someone at a certain moment. It is in order to, to use Yifu Tuan's formula, time flowing into space. Landscape is therefore always radically singular and individual. It is unique. That is always this one landscape in front of me. The English poet Coleridge, who toured the Lake District around 1800 and tried to fix the singularity of the landscapes perceived, was always desperate because of the impossibility of finding the right words for his unique impressions. I cite the head of Glen Nevish, how simple for a painter, and in how many words, and how laboriously, and in what dim similitudes, and how slow and dragging circumlocutions must I give it, he complains, oh, for words to explain how slate and limestone lie, silly words, I'm vexed with you. Impossibility to tell what is singular and give, given only in a moment. Dealing with landscape, we can nevertheless arrive to the opposite finding, too. Landscape experience is never immediately given, but the result of very complex cultural processes. We learned, in order to put it differently, to identify a series of particular landscape patterns, and we did so only from the 18th century on. Take, for instance, the picturesque. In order to recognize it, our ancestors of just two and a half centuries ago had really to learn its new language. People like the famous Reverend Gilpin actually developed a catalog of landscape patterns. And it is in search for these extremely similar landscapes that the tourists of the 18th and 19th century traveled and to, had to look out. See, there was a whole industry of these publications, books, so picturesque landscape had to be explained in order to be seen. It's not naturally given. And people naturally to react to this. Here you see other of the um, Gilpin's publications. Another instrument used in order to create similarity is a cloth glass. 
By using it, the travelers combine the formal identity provided by the scopic device with the stylistic identity of a well-defined landscape type. You see cloth glasses in the British Museum, Gainsborough using his cloth glass, or today's cloth glass, if you want. This is our contemporary cloth glass. So we fabricate landscapes. And we learned to do this, and very recently. The reality of these, the impressions discovered in the world out there correspond to a global and highly Eurocentric model. Uh, that is landscape painting of the landscape painting of the 17th century, especially the landscape paintings of Claude Laurent. In reality, the range of pleasing landscapes is quite narrow, and it privileges repetition or the recognition of the recognition of the similar patterns and aspects. We learn to appreciate the bucolic, the romantic, the sublime, the wild landscape, thanks to painters like Claude Lorraine and many others of the 17th century. British travelers, for, for example, of the 19th century, before the 19th century, were never interested in the British landscape, in its individuality. They rather went to control if the beauty of the lit British landscape corresponded to the classical beauty which they knew from the Italian models. So in general, travelers of the 18th and 19th century organized their tours by mentally identifying and photographing extremely similar, photographing in their minds, extremely similar standard landscapes. The second effect of the aesthetics of nature had even more striking consequences. The picturesque style applied to gardening and to landscape architecture went so far as to produce on site an increasing number of landscapes that looked very much the same. Wörlitz in Germany looked like Ermenonville in France or Storehead in Britain, and they all looked more or less like a painting of Claude Lorrain. You never know where you are. So you're picturesque. Uh, at first sight, we think these are very, very highly exceptional places, very individual with their owners and a nice, uh, very complex programs. But if you start to analyze it, you see that it's almost the same image coming back again and again. So from Kent and Brown to Repton and Olmsted and up to our days, we're faced with the fact that we build landscapes that have to be close, that have to be very close to a general model in order to please. My point here is that a certain degree of perceptive and cultural standardization is characteristic for landscape experience in general. That in dealing with uniformity today, uh, this has to be waived against this tradition. So standardization probably always existed in the landscape experience. Take, for example, uh, Tuscany, Tuscan landscape. The Tuscan landscape, as we see it and we love it more or less today, is an invention of the British tourists of the 18th century. Before, these kind of trees were not used. Uh, uh, they were used mostly in cemeteries. So this is a standardized landscape. But today, it is taken as the topical um, um, landscape of Tuscany. Naturally, with time, new categories appeared. And especially in the 19th century, there were many other aspects of standardization. I don't have the time to enter this, but for example, the invention of the national landscapes in the 19th century, the French, the German, the Italians, they invented their national landscapes and then they tried to keep the, to, 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 to make everything possible that the national landscape or something identified as a national landscape had never to change. Um, I will come now to um, landscape architecture uh, and uh, to uh, another way to speak about um, the problem of standardization and another way to uh, confront it. Mm, naturally, I will try to give you some examples uh, concerning standardization in today's uh, landscape architecture. But before coming to it, uh, there is something which I always like to mention, um, landscape architecture is a strange discipline. It has existed now for 250 years. Arguably, it starts with uh, Humphrey Repton, 1789. It's a year of the French Revolution, too. And it's uh, his uh, business card with a very pragmatic sense. Uh, every time he, he found a client, he immediately gave him uh, this business card. And he calls himself a landscape gardener. So let's say our discipline existed now for two and a half centuries. And uh, the strange thing is that landscape architecture has uh, almost uh, no history. Very difficult to find a history, a complete history of landscape architecture. Uh, not very strong in theory either. And uh, even the corpus of landscape architecture is not so clear. So uh, 
I had the chance to travel a lot around the world uh, with this Swiss landscape architecture exhibition. And I, I liked always to ask colleagues to tell me, what is your corpus? I mean, what are 10 works which really count? And um, even uh, most, most of them stopped at three. Or if there were uh, colleagues who were in the business, but they would cite their own work. Well, this is another work. But it's very difficult. So I, I always say it's a very strange discipline where if we were in, I don't know, painters, uh, we could agree. Uh, there were some people like Van Gogh and Monet, and they had some talent. So we won't start again. But in landscape architecture, no one knows what is a corpus, what is the standard. What, what is, where do we come from? So uh, this makes it even difficult to, 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 to make presentations. I mean, what do we speak about? Uh, what is landscape architecture anyhow? So I think it's, a, it's something we, we have to take into consideration. So, and maybe, and this is linked to my topic, maybe this has an effect on homogenization and standardization because landscape architecture doesn't have a clear corpus. We don't have a a progression, take it however, in what sense you want, but there is not a clear history. So very often we're dealing with repetition. The same forms come back and again, 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 and we would like to ask some of our colleagues, didn't you see that there were some guys like Sorensen or some other guys who did some good work? So you should look to people who worked before you, but no. So this is, I think this is a real problem. It's not the problem I want to deal uh, with today, but I want to mention it. So. Um, what, is, what about difference, individuality, and the culture of difference in landscape architecture? So I, um, I, my main example, I will try uh, to, uh, I, I took one example by our friend Paolo Burghi. I think you know his work. And this is Cardada in uh, Switzerland, uh, in the southern part, in the Italian part of Switzerland. And um, I, I like to show it because I think it's a, it's a polysemic object. And I don't think we have so many polysemic objects in landscape architecture. So what do I mean by a polysemic objects? I will try very, very rapidly to give you uh, just an idea of what uh, uh, I take uh, as a polysemic or object, uh, something which is many things at the same time. Uh, and marked by difference. So this is an observatory in the Alps. Uh, there is a first platform, and then there is a second platform, and uh, Burgi built it. So this is a beautiful platform. And uh, the starting point for Burgi was uh, what happens when you go in the Alps and uh, you're confronted to a place where you uh, will experience sublime landscape, uh, and uh, you see something extraordinary. And uh, his idea was, uh, well, we have to do something which is not banal, which is not ordinary, which is not generic. He wanted to do something exceptional, but at the same time being uh, full of respect for uh, the local elements. Um, here you see the context. It's on Lago Maggiore, <clears throat> not very far from the city of Locarno. And when he started to work on this object, he was very much aware that there is a context. Uh, it's a Swiss context, too. You know, Kenneth Clark said this is the first painting in uh, European paint, in landscape painting, and maybe in European in landscape painting altogether, where you can recognize a certain place. It's a bay, it's a Lake Geneva, and you see Mont Blanc behind. And uh, so there is a history behind the discovery uh, of uh, Alps in general and of Alpine landscape. And uh, we have uh, many, many important steps. And when Birgi started to, 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 to work on this project to build the platform where you have a dialogue with the uh, Alpine landscape, he knew that uh, mountains were hated until the 17th century, that they were interpreted as a the place of the devil and of uh, generally in a completely negative way. And only in the 17th century, things started to change. And then in the 18th century, they become something sublime. This is Kaspar Wolf. Uh, and Kaspar Wolf made a very important career uh, showing us uh, the sublime quality of the Alps. Uh, so uh, when uh, Burgi uh, built his platform, um, he um, related himself to the uh, history of the sublime and to uh, the history of, uh, we could say, the modern subject, which liked to go to these places and to elevate himself and to see the world from upside down, which was uh, something almost revolutionary. But naturally, Burgi travel, worked uh, at this project in the 20th century, and uh, there is a history of the view of our scopic relation to the world, which is marked by our desire to look from upside down. Uh, 
And in the 20th century, for example, aerial photography became extremely influent. This was a photographer and a pilot. He pretended that he would both photograph and pilot his plane at the same time. I think it's impossible with his cameras, which were very uh, 20 kilogram cameras, but still he was uh, extremely powerful and influential. And so there, there's a, there is a history of our way to see the world uh, and to relate our world to, to the world uh, through vision. And uh, Berge uh, creates uh, this uh, platform uh, by relating to many, many things. For example, uh, this is uh, how in the 19th century uh, our view from the mountains was organized. You see these platforms, these belvederes, which was very typical. Uh, quite strange that already uh, people uh, thought that it's necessary when you arrive at the top of the mountain to have something, uh, a further step to go even higher and to have this last step which gives you the ultimate possibility to conquer really sight. And you see how tourism organized this already in the 19th century and uh, how uh, it became almost a ridiculous uh, something. So what is, uh, uh, if you go to the Alps, you will find hundreds and hundreds of these places. They're quite sad, uh, very badly uh, built, uh, uh, extremely uh, banal, I would say. And uh, um, Berge wanted to make something very different. And I think it's really the depths of his knowledge which transformed this project into something polysemic. For example, he knew very well the tradition of the panorama, of panoramas, and uh, when Barker invented the panorama quite uh, early uh, at Leicester Square, he showed some panoramas of the mountains. You remember that the panorama, the idea between, behind Barker's project was uh, uh, there are so many people who cannot afford to travel, and even if we can afford to travel, it's dangerous, and why uh, use your money for traveling? And I will show you the world, and you come into the panorama. And panoramas became very, very influential, and they influenced uh, landscape architecture and many, many other disciplines. And uh, so people went into the panorama, and then they could have a 360 degree view of the world. So Birgi uh, tries to uh, do something very different. Um, that's what he had not in mind, these sad constructions, which we find in the Alps. And uh, he wanted to do something poetic and uh, complex. Uh, he was beware of the uh, he, almost the responsibility to, to, to what happens if we, we arrive to such a platform, how do we look? Uh, to the world, and at the same time he was attacked by some people. They said, you're a landscape architect, you like nature, and why do you use concrete, and what about concrete here? And he said, no problem with concrete, I think uh, I can live with it, and uh, there is a history of concrete, and concretes are stone, and stone is my theme, because here uh, we are uh, in an important place where two geological phenomena, the African and the European plate, comes together. And you see the same landscape, but actually the mountains are very different because one of the one mountain range is 380 million years old and the other, the other one is 120 million years old. And as the two, uh, the, the African and the European plate, they touch each other, that we, that's why we have so many earthquakes in Italy and so on. And he tried to explain this by taking some samples of stones and he integrated this into his platform. So you see, it's very, it's not very rhetoric, rhetorical, it's very simple. It uh, works with citation and uh, with other elements in order to let us enter uh, into this place. And I think he was very much aware too about what happened in the Alps and not only in the Alps, so throughout the world. So in the 19th century, we destroyed uh, or transformed almost all of our traditional landscapes. And this is a price, you know, these are the wonderful five-star hotels in the Alps. So you could here as a bourgeois sit there at a balcony and uh, enter into relation with wonderful landscapes, but that's a price, the transformation. So we, uh, uh, an extreme, extremely brutal transformation of uh, uh, the alpine reality. And it continues. For example, we have these kinds of platforms uh, or, uh, and this kind, and that's what he didn't have in mind. And I think uh, the complexity and um, the scale and uh, almost the poetic quality of his uh, platform is uh, really the result of, uh, um, of a cultural approach of how you project this.
And naturally, he was very much aware of the discovery of the mountains and of landscape. You remember Petrarch. We some, sometimes we read that Petrarch was the first modern man. Jakob Burkhardt said this, and that Petrarch discovered mountains when he went to Mont Ventoux. So uh, the discovery of uh, looking from upside down is something very specific, and it has a history. It's not, uh, it's not given for in every culture and at every moment. It's a cultural possibility. And then uh, take the round form, the circular form. Why did he choose it? I don't think he had Sorensen in mind, but we could think of Sorensen's Mindedal and of Noguchi and uh, of many other examples. I think uh, the round form this has something we could call, call agoratic. It's like a forum. So, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, to, to, to build his observatory in this way uh, is... Uh, there are many, many, it's like a poetics of citation and suggestions. So I create something, it looks very, very simple, but it's not simple at all. And another idea behind uh, Cardada was, uh, mm, well, this is something which seems almost to float, floating. And the idea of floating, you know, in Rem Kolhas, it's so important. And uh, the idea of architecture, this starts already with Boulet and many other people, Ledoux in the 18th century, uh, architecture as an elevation and the desire to, uh, to, to almost float uh, above the world. And then the relation to stones and to rocks and the aesthetics of rocks. Uh, this is, by the way, a painting. It's not a photography. So I think uh, he had a very keen sense of what, what do I want to keep uh, and how do I want to work. And then many other stories and many other amounts. It's to, uh, I'm sure you, many of you know Paolo Burgis Cardada. So they're uh, iconic signs integrated, uh, and they have something to do uh, with uh, history and time, especially philosophy of time, the very long geological time, hundreds of millions of years, our time, and the time when you come as a visitor and you step by. Or this is Monte Verita. Uh, a very important place in the in the 90, around 1900, where uh, artists, anarchists from everywhere to Europe came to this place in Ascona, and uh, uh, they developed modern dance and poetry and art and etc. And it is not very far away from Cardada either. So all these things come together uh, in Cardada, and uh, at that place um, he built a fountain. And uh, this fountain, you see, he wanted to build himself. himself. And um, here you see uh, the fountain. And that's how he chose it. So that's the history of this fountain. And that's, uh, again, uh, the making of the fountain. And that's the making of the fountain again. And then it will be installed there. So it's something very individual, very particular. And he spent a lot of time to find the right place and the right, uh, the, the, the right material. So it's something completely individual. And uh, later it was destroyed. And uh, so he rebuilt it in another place. And uh, one of the starting points of my idea to speak about uh, standardization was that Paolo is working now in Geneva at the CERN. And he, uh, he works on, uh, there is a, tram here, and uh, uh, so uh, it's an urban project. And here you see the plan. And he wanted to build a bench here. And he told me, it's impossible. I cannot, I, I cannot uh, build my bench. So he wanted to draw a bench, like he drew the fountain before. And uh, he said, it's impossible. Because they asked me to do benches, to buy benches in a catalog. And uh, he said, it's not only about standardization, so, but it's about certification. He said, if you don't have the right certification, then you cannot uh, go on. And uh, so uh, he had to, so he couldn't do it. And um, it's this kind of benches he had to choose. So they told him, if you want to have a bench, we'll give you a catalog. And it's almost impossible for him to design it, even in Switzerland. You know, we're in Switzerland, we're not even in a European community. So we're, we're a very free country, and we're very proud of being free. But it doesn't work anymore for many reasons, certification, standardization, economic reasons. So, uh, and, uh, so this was a, I think this is a good example of what I mean by standardization and the impossibility of uh, uh, being original. 
Then another example, a contemporary example, is a, a square in Milan, Piazza Gaia Aulenti, quite recent. And uh, Piazza Gaulenti is, for me, an example of a really very, uh, a sort of international style in landscape architecture or in urban design uh, with quite a poor quality. And uh, you see, uh, we are here in Milan, but we could be very easily in Berlin too on Potsdamer Platz. And by the way, the Italian journal said, oh, uh, Milan is becoming now like Berlin. So they said, finally, Milan became like Berlin. So you see how uh, something which uh, maybe for some people is uh, something extremely negative, uh, on the contrary, was celebrated as well. We too, we have these uh, new urban plazas, which are wonderful. And uh, you see here, and if you look to it, it could be everywhere. So it's a sort of Dubaiization of Milan. And uh, uh, this Dubaiization, you can find it everywhere. You see, it's horrible. I mean, it's a sort of urban nightmare. And, uh, and people even celebrate it. They think, oh, wow, it's full of, and you see, no, no life here. Huh? So uh, they celebrate it, but still, there are some problems. And then, uh, again, uh, Piazza Gao Elenti. And uh, uh, you see, um, no, let's just go back Whoop. here. You see the solar tree. But this, this solar tree is really something terrible. I mean, uh, it should be forbidden. And it's not, it's not, it's not Malay Stevens' revolutionary solar tree of 1925, you know, the, which was really a scandal and it, which is something poetic and which is a provocation and which is many things together. No. It's really these kinds of Hollywood solar trees. They should forbid it. I mean, uh, we, we, there are trees. We still have trees. So why, why solar trees, anyhow? <laughs> and so you see the, the standardization in solar trees. So that's how Piazza Gaulenti works. Or for example, uh, I was uh, in September in Morocco. And uh, another standardization. You see the whole lighting system. You see in the whole country uh, the same lighting system everywhere. So you see the same lamps everywhere. Uh, probably it's a, it's a wonderful business for the one guy who does this in a whole country, but for the whole country as a, a totality, it's an extreme standardization. And so we go towards a poor um, solutions, or this is a wonderful and completely ironic uh, four palm tree. So now the, they, the telephone companies, they hide their antennas uh, in, with palm trees. And you find it everywhere, hundreds and even thousands of these things. So this, again, is standardization. So we have, uh, in landscape architecture and urbanism, generally, standardization is uh, so powerful. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, where does this come from? Why are we confronted to this? Naturally, there are standards, and more and more standards become important. Uh, and we have, well, in the US, uh, you have these standards. But I think it's, uh, it's more, the, the whole situation is more complex, far more complex. Uh, it's linked uh, to globalization, too, and to some corporations. Uh, take, for example, if we look to the uh, important, to really important uh, in the interna international uh, architecture firms, etc. What do you take? SOM is very pr uh, proud of this. I mean, this is really uh, this is uh, the main example for what they do, huh? and probably I think they're really happy about this. But it could be, you know, this outlook. It could be everywhere. Or if you take ACOM, you see again, uh, it's a plaza. It could be everywhere too. It's very difficult to say where we are. Or here again. Uh, uh, you see, where are we, and uh, uh, why do all these pl um, places uh, look the same? So um, maybe uh, before um, coming uh, to really the final remarks, um, uh, how can we interpret landscape architecture, and how can we interpret the urban, the urban reality altogether? So as you heard, I. Uh, deal sometimes uh, I still deal with literature and comparative literature, even if I, I I'm mostly now in landscape architecture and related disciplines. But uh, I will make a, a short detour by literary theory because I think uh, what interests me is uh, who is responsible? Who is responsible for standardization? Who is responsible for standardization in architecture? Who is responsible for standardization in landscape architecture? Who is responsible in general? 
And I think we, we need to identify someone who is responsible, at least to, to start to, 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 to think about how to understand the world. So if you take literary theory very, very quickly, uh, in the 18th and 19th century, everything was about the author. So we had the figure which was the author, and the author was always someone who was uh, the author in a very enthusiastic sense. So think of uh, the parks of the 18th and 19th century. They're full of these sculptures of Edgar Allan Poe and uh, Pushkin and Tolstoy. So it's the author. And the, what does the author? Well, the author, he writes something. It's a text and a novel, for instance, or a poem. And so the author, there is a causality between the two. The author writes a poem, a composer composes music, and so on. So the author is responsible for something. So there is an author, and we can take him for responsible. But at the same time, hermeneutics in the 18th and 19th century said, no, uh, everything which, every discourse is a result not only of an author, but of a system. Take, for example, poetry. Well, when you write a poem, you choose a sonnet. And the sonnet doesn't belong to you, but it belongs to literature, and it belongs to a system of literature. And in the system of literature, you have the system of language, and so on. So every discourse is both a result of an author and a result of a system at the same time. And then Kant comes in the 18th century, and he says that there is something which we could call the autonomy of works of art. Once a work of art exists, it doesn't belong to anyone. Once the architect finishes his building, it's a building, and it exists like a poem. And it's, well, he goes on to do other stuff. And so it's autonomous. And you have to interpret it on its own basis. And this is the autonomy. Very important uh, idea comes uh, back in the new criticism, where they say, don't rely on the author. Don't rely on the system, rely on the discourse itself. And so the author is something you have to be careful about the author. Anyhow, we don't know anything about the intentions of the author. And an author is someone who is living. It's far too complex to, tip, to, to speak about intentions. And, uh, but there is autonomy. And the system, sometimes you have to be careful with the system too. And then in the 20th century, we have structuralism. And what do we mean by structuralism? Well, if you want to understand the discourse, you have to understand it on its own terms. So it's what we call reflexivity. It means that every object which we produce, especially in culture, is to be, has to be interpreted on its own basis. So every novel is the, has, is the implicit theory of itself, and every building, important building has an implicit theory of itself. And this is structuralism. It means in order to understand the discourse, you have to understand its structure. And this became quite important to the Russian formalist and many, many other people. And uh, then uh, came post-structuralism, and they said, the author doesn't exist. We think that there are people which we call authors, someone who wrote a book, but it's never the author who writes a book, but it's a system which writes a book. Because the system is something which uh, you find it in Roland Barthes and in many people. They say there is a general system of literature and of the language, and it's much stronger as an author. You think you're the author, but you're not the author. You think you're the author, but there are so many constraints that you're not really the author. And then, uh, uh, so the author disappears almost. And then in the 20th century, Umberto Eco and Wolfgang Gieser and many other people said, well, there is someone who's lacking here. It's the reader. And there needs to be someone, the spectator. And uh, so now, finally, we have a theory where we take all these things together. So why did I speak about this? Because I think uh, it's an interesting analogy. Because uh, we can ask ourselves, uh, ourselves uh, what happens uh, when we're confronted to standardization? What happens when we deal with a uh, work of landscape architecture? Who is the author? And how strong is the author? And naturally, we can go from a weak author to a very strong author. Sometimes we have strong authorship, even in urbanism. Think uh, of Niemeyer and Lucio Costa when they designed Brasilia. is strong authorship. And in many other cases, the author almost disappears. And uh, then we have the system, which can be very weak, uh, or it can be very strong. And then the reader, where well, the reader or the spectator is normally extremely weak. Uh, there is a tradition of architecture, and I would say of planning generally, that uh, the consumer, the user, doesn't really count. I mean, we're still in a tradition of architecture and planning generally as production. And uh, we're very happy when the production is solid and when it's well done. And uh, uh, once we finish it, 
once we finish a building, once we finish, uh, finish a square, when we finish a project, well, we go on to the next one. So we're never interested in a real life or what James Dixon Hunt calls the afterlife, but we're just in the, is that in the logic of production. And so the reader or the user is always uh, the poor guy in this triangle. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, if we are dealing with standardization and um, homogeneity, well, where does it come from? Does it come from the system? Does it come from the author? What happens? Or is there happening? Uh, what happens here? So I think this model is a very simple model, and it's, it's a, an extreme simplification of many things which became extremely complex in literary theory in the 20th century. But uh, it's a, I, I find it an interesting analogy in order to ask uh, uh, who is responsible for all this, for standardization, who is responsible for the quality and the non-quality, the lack of quality of today's spaces, who's really responsible. And uh, well, uh, I'm afraid that uh, all these things will become a little more complicated with uh, what I called here the BIM über alles, so the super BIM or the hyper BIM. You know that now we go from BIM to LIM and uh, landscape information modeling is somewhere there. And uh, I think uh, things may become worse and more problematic. And I was uh, three weeks ago in a strange place, College Station in Texas, but the good surprise besides the fact that many students were armed, so it was a little surprising for me. Even if in Switzerland we can buy arms very easily, but uh, there uh, my colleagues told me, be careful what you say, because many of our students come with their Smith and Wesson, so I was. But I, I went to their lab, and uh, uh, I saw the biggest beam cave of the world, so uh, 120 degrees, and uh, um, Julian Kang is building now uh, 360 degree, uh, no, 300 degree uh, um, BIM cave. And uh, naturally, it's uh, really fascinating, and there is a story behind BIM linked to standards, but uh, in a perspective of cultural history, uh, well, I was amazed uh, concerning the, 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 what happens here, because it, it somehow, it, it's almost a promise to replace the world I think it's both a very old history and something very new. Uh, probably we're still in the Brunelleschian invention of modern space, and this is 16th century, how uh, people imagine that uh, uh, we can rationalize uh, the idea of the grid, or what the Italians call the velo reticolato, so how we can rationalize the size, the, the, the view of the world. So I think uh, the BIM and the BIM cave are uh, representations of uh, a way to see the world which was born in Europe in the 15th century and starts with Brunelleschi and many other people. And then it became uh, uh, this link between technology and vision. Very, very, and one of the examples is naturally landscape. I think the landscape view uh, comes from here and from the 15th century. Uh, so this is a BIM cave. And here you see the grid. Uh, and it's used in the, back in the 17th century. But uh, the BIM cave or the, uh, the, the hyper BIM we're, uh, we'll have in two or three years, well, uh, it has to do something with the panorama too, because this is a, a panorama in Leicester Square, uh, Barker's panorama, and uh, the promise to see the world. And these were these panoramas. You, you went to Leicester Square and you could see Paris or Jerusalem or any other town or any other reality. And, uh, uh, the new beam, uh, well, it's really the promise of a full, of a possibility to, 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 to enter another world, which is our world. And this will mean that for planners and landscape architects and architects, it's even easier not to have any real contact with the world out there. And it becomes even a reality. Uh, this is uh, in Estonia, where uh, people are very proud that this was done with the uh, last BIM technology, but at the same time, you see it's panorama, so uh, how, uh, and it's, a, it's naturally a shopping center, so how all these things come together, uh, uh, standardization, uh, BIM, and so on. And of course, uh, the thing which comes in mind is Plato's cave, because the BIM cave is a cave, and uh, while well, you remember that uh, Plato argues that we never see the world, but we actually see only shadows. And so I ask myself, what do we see uh, 
what kind of perception, what is the influence of all this new technology on perception? And uh, uh, do we see the world or uh, do we see only shadows? So uh, probably the things I'm most interested in now is uh, how do all these technologies transform our perception of the world? And I think that's where we have to start when we deal with these phenomena. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Michael, for that um, incredibly generous talk. And um, I, I want to turn directly over to the audience. I know Michael's very um, happy to uh, receive your questions. So. Thanks. I was wondering about uh, standardization in the past, and I think that, if, for example, in like a medieval European town, as well as in Hasmani in Paris or something, there's always standardization. So within the, uh, like Siena, for example, all of the buildings will be built using the same tectonic logic. And uh, I think it's true around the world in a way. So now that the, the zone of awareness for the people is global, Due to communication technology, is there any? Do you really think there's any way to stop standardization without stopping communication? Mm -hmm. Where well, two observations. First, you spoke about Siena. Yeah, well, Siena is interesting because I don't think it's standardized. If you look to the good government, you know the painting 1350, you will see that this is a portrait of the city. And the city portraits itself, very interestingly. Uh, and uh, all the houses are different. And there is a sense of difference. And I would even say a sort of pride in difference. So the reality of the European city in the 14th century is identity through difference and by difference. And you have poor house, you have some houses which are very rich people and some are poor people. And uh, it's almost programmatically about variety in Siena. And it's quite late, I think it's really in the 18th and 19th century that the idea of uniformity, uniformity comes up and that it enters uh, the urban space. So I think it's extremely recent and probably linked to some ideologies. And your second observation, uh, can we stop standardization? Can we avoid standardization? I don't know. I'm, uh, I try to understand what happens. So I think uh, I'm interested at first in analysis and uh, try to see what are the phenomena we're confronted at. Um, and um, it's, it's not easy because uh, all these values, uh, that's one of the ideas I try to express, is that all these oppositions are extremely ideological. So, and especially when we deal with landscape. So our landscape patterns and what we define as beautiful landscapes is, are always very much influenced by ideology. For example, people don't like to hear about this, but 20th century landscape architecture, there is a, a history, a very important history linked to ideology and especially to far-right ideology. Take, uh, for example, uh, Schulze Naumburg's famous uh, Kulturarbeiten, uh, his book where he speaks about the good and the bad landscape. And you see uh, that uh, a certain idea of organic landscape uh, can um, be interpreted very easily as uh, the ideological idea of some uh, uh, philosophers of the 19th and 20th century. So I don't think, uh, we're, I think it's far too dangerous to think we're against, we're for standardization, we have to stop it, we don't have to stop it. Uh, I, I'm interested in saying, uh, well, we're confronted to it, and let's understand what happens, and let's see, in some cases we may react against it, and in some cases it may be okay too. So uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's far too, maybe we, we can do some intelligent criticism once we understand the phenomenon in its full complexity, but we're not there. And uh, so it's the same with BIM. So I went to this laboratory because I was interested in the critical impact of BIM. So I work now on a project how digital perception transforms uh, our interpretation of the world. 
and especially in studios. So we have a project ongoing where we go into the studios, architecture studios, urbanists, uh, landscape architects, and I'm interested how drones, uh, programs, uh, uh, satellites, everything, uh, Google Maps, take everything together, and how the digital transform the perception so that actually people see the world differently. And uh, so I'm interested in these phenomena before trying to judge and to say I'm against it or for it. Mm -hmm. Ed, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I'm really interested in the term generic as you use it and maybe helping to expand um, your, as Ed said, very generous lecture. Um, many of the examples you use to define landscape architecture seem to either put in a position of framing landscape or um, viewing landscape or more contemporary examples, you're looking at items, objects, uh, hard materials that almost sit on or seem to almost decorate the landscape. Whereas myself, as a landscape architect, I think generatively of landscape as moving earth and planting materials and hydrology uh, and, and the very stuff of the planet, if you will, and not the stuff that sits on top of the planet. So I wonder if you might be able to talk about the generic vis-a-vis -vis landscape architects in this missing canon, which I couldn't agree more with you about, such as Brewers in Holland or Capability of Brown in uh, England or Olmsted in the United States, whereby land itself was the design medium. Mm -hmm. So the generic in landscape architecture, in the history of landscape architecture. Yeah, vis-a-vis -vis moving land, moving uh, and, be, and inhabiting the actual cultural landscape, as opposed to the view of an existing landscape, or the positioning of the viewer in terms of contemporary landscape, which your examples used, viewing platforms, solar trees, and mm -hmm. vulgarities of path uh, patterns, which I couldn't agree more. Uh, however, it's, it's, it's maybe not the stuff of the very landscape itself. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> the first um, idea which comes to mind is that in the 18th century, 18th and 19th century, well, you have all these people who move Earth, as you say, already. Take uh, Repton or Morel. Morel, who was, uh, by the way, an engineer of the Pont et Chaussée, and he became the first French landscape architect around 1800. But uh, the result they had in mind was almost uh, always something extremely generic. Or uh, You remember when the Marquis de Girardin says, uh, if as a landscape architect you want to work, you have to create a tableau, a painting, and it's a sort of complete immobility. And it has to be recognizable because it has to correspond in some way to patterns which you know from painting. So actually what they created were living paintings and they used all the machinery and shrubs and trees and everything. But uh, the result had to be static. So there is a contradiction there because uh, the Anglo-Chinese garden or picturesque garden starts with the philo philosophy of moving around and freely um, creating the reality where you walk. But at the same time, the ultimate sense of a picturesque garden it was the recognizability. So the possibility to, as you said, to frame it and to freeze it. And if you didn't have uh, frozen landscapes, that is paintings, living paintings, then uh, your garden had no sense. So I think that's one of the uh, ways that standardization worked uh, back in the 18th and then in the 19th century. Um, in contemporary, well, contemporary landscape architecture is more difficult because um, as you said, what do we speak about? So we, we, we should start to have a corpus and uh, who does landscape architecture and who are the, who is the, who are the authors and what is the, there is a field where uh, landscapers and urbanists and planners, well, who, who, who is the one who transformed the world? So uh, what happens in these places? But I think uh, Another thing I'm interested in is, I don't answer, but uh, still, uh, another thing I'm, uh, I'm interested in, or answered only half, uh, is uh, the history, the influence of software in the last 20 years, 
on the form, the gestalt of architecture and of landscape architecture. So what happens, how strongly did software and the recent software really create certain realities? What happened there? And so what I would be interested in is how uh, does everything which is digital actually create a reality on the ground? And with BIM, it's fascinating because naturally we can say uh, it goes really from the, from the screen to the machine, to the 3D printers and everything and to the production. So I think we go one step further because now, while in the 18th and 19th century the result was 2D, it was a nice picture, it was a beautiful picture, now it's 3D. So you go from 2D to 3D. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps it, this is more another thought on what you presented, particularly on the last, on that little diagram that you were talking about, the system, the forces, the, the publics. And I'm wondering if in the present context, if it makes sense to rethink about the forces that are producing this generic. Because exactly this landscape that you're looking at, beyond the form and the effects, they are the result of certain capital demands, issues of marketing, issues of creating a certain image. Um, so I'm wondering if you have further thoughts on, on expanding um, the conversation about the systems and the constituencies, the stakeholders that are generating these images of landscape, or perhaps if this could be a good moment to bring, to unpack what system may mean. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, probably um, the sort of systemic approach. So going back to what we call the system would be important because as we all, we all understand, uh, uh, author and authorship becomes weaker and weaker and uh, the reader or spectator becomes weaker and weaker and the one reality which becomes almost overwhelming is the system. And, uh, but we, if we start with, we have to define what we, uh, when we talk about the system today, it's very different to what uh, the structuralist and the post-structuralist defined as a system back in the, at the end of the 20th century. So uh, uh, probably is digital system, for example, a, a possibility to say that we have a sort of uh, auto-referential digital system which be, will become so powerful that it doesn't need us at the moment. So even we as designers will disappear forever and the system will design the world without any need of, uh, and this would be a sort of totalitarian system which produces, even our desire will be controlled by it. So I think uh, this is uh, probably one of the dire directions one, one has to inquire, but uh, uh, I, I wouldn't have a, a system theory, uh, a ready-made system theory which I could cite in order to, to apply it, but uh, certainly, um, yeah, maybe if you think about system, in hermeneutics, the system was the language. So, uh, because probably the inventors of hermeneutics thought that the language is the most general way to define all the discourses. And uh, language brings us back to rhetorics. So probably there is a sort of rhetorics of the system, which is extremely powerful today. And uh, the rhetorics would be uh, a sort of uh, non-written uh, uh, conglomerate of uh, implicit rules which actually shape the world. So I would, uh, one of the directions I would look into is uh, uh, a return of rhetorics. So uh, that's one of the ideas I would have, but uh, I don't have any other answers. Huh? Uh, yeah, thanks for your extremely generous lecture. It was really fascinating. Um, and Q&A sessions is great yeah. too. Um, my question relates, I think, to how you concluded the lecture, uh, which I, in my experience, uh, the conclusion that you provided seemed a little um, 
don't know, a little depressing in a way. And I'm wondering <laughs> if that was your intent or if you think that digital technologies, BIM specifically, could perhaps usher in a new age of, um, say, even returning to uh, Brunelleschi and his model of the, the Florentian dome and using the model and not the two-dimensional drawing as the means to generate architecture or landscape architecture, whereas now, um, you know, you make your fancy Revit model, but you still produce a two-dimensional drawing. You still hand that to a construction team. They, you're still, you still have that two-dimensional to three-dimensional abstraction, whereas potentially with augmented reality, you could just live in the model and design in the three-dimensional and build in the three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. is, is, is that a positive development? Would you, do you see a, ret a return towards non-standardization through the ability of the craftsman to potentially mm -hmm. have more more influence on what's being built, uh, the more more use of local materials, et cetera, mm -hmm. because you're not abstracting the to the two dimensional and producing a document set. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know. Well, first of all, I didn't want to depress you, and I don't want to sound like. Uh, uh, an old professor, you know, already Plato, you remember, he said, uh, oh, now all these people start to read, it's the end of culture, it's horrible, because uh, before everything was oral and everyone had an incredible memory, and now all these young people, they all, they, all these hipsters, they read, so it's horrible, so it's the end of culture for, so I don't, I'm not interested in a sort of uh, straightforward criticism of uh, our tools, I think uh, it's like people are crying about, uh, internet and everything becomes poorer? I don't think so. We have to use it in intelligent ways, so this is clear. And uh, that's why the link with Brunelleschi, uh, probably there is something very Brunelleschian and extremely intelligent in these technologies, but still there are an interpretation of the world, they're not a reality. So it's a very, very powerful tra tradition, and uh, many people like Panofsky, etc., said uh, probably the strength, the, the extreme power of the Brunelleschi model, in order to simplify, is because it's an extreme simplification of the world. If the world becomes mathematical and geometrical, if I can control it, I have a rational model, and it's so powerful because it becomes universal because it's so powerful, but it's not a true model, etc. So when you speak about the local and craftsmanship and other things, uh, I can speak about only about um, uh, the quality I saw in many, in many landscape architecture studios. And uh, probably this is something very real. I, I would say, and even as students, uh, what I say to my students, you have to be at the same time extremely rapid and extremely slow. And to be extremely rapid means you have to use all the devices which you have today, and you have to be the strongest one in, when you use them, so you have to know everything and to use everything possible. But at the same time, you have to close your eyes and you have to take your time. And uh, to take your time uh, means to for probably you have uh, wonderful ways to use uh, all these technologies of today but uh, maybe the, the next day you, you go back to drawing something uh, which you draw. And I think uh, uh, many examples show us that uh, probably the compromise between slow and uh, fast, uh, technological, and uh, something which you do, but I believe a lot in the intelligence of the hand. And because I think it's not only about what you draw and what you do with your hand, but it's about time. You take your time. And when you take your time, it means you reflect. So your reflection. And I think there is a there is a distance. And when you have a distance, well, then you look differently to what you produce. And uh, the, the the danger of uh, everything linked to machines to the digital is that you don't have the distance anymore. And so probably we have to be at the same time organic and mechanic and fast and slow. So, but certainly not depressed. Yeah. <laughs> Festina Lente, make haste slowly. Hmm. Will you all join me in thanking uh, Michael Jaga for this beautiful lecture? Thanks.